We have just done a lecture on medical legal issues and infectious disease um, that was very enjoyable. I have provided more of the legal aspect of the lecture and Fred who is uh, specialized in infectious disease and emergency medicine focused on the infectious disease. Several of the cases that we discussed uh, I see over and over in medical legal uh, journals and cases um, and there were some generalizations that we shared. One is uh, spinal epidural abscess is like an epidemic in the courtroom right now and uh, those cases usually end up being a payout and there's um, certain typical features that, that Fred can uh, tell us with them. Necrotizing fasciitis was a case we had, another horrible disease, terrible outcomes, but in the legal cases this tends to not um, pay out that much. Um, we talked about following up blood cultures. Uh, often there is a dropping of the ball in that and the cultures are not followed up. You have to have a system in your department. Uh, these cases almost always pay out. And we talked about the high risk of a patient without a spleen and multiple medical legal cases, mostly with the payout when these people come in with fevers. The, um, Fred was able to illustrate each of these entities and some of the hallmarks of making their diagnoses and um, tip-offs. Yeah, we, um, at the end we had basically talked about some take-home points. Pay attention to uh, abnormal vital signs, vital signs uh, uh, it is extremely important for you to reassess them and document repeat vital signs. Other area that we see typically is uh, addressing abnormal laboratory tests where a laboratory test was obtained and it was abnormal but it wasn't further um, uh, addressed or at least there was no explanation within the chart as far as uh, what the abnormality is contributed to. Uh, other areas that we also uh, have seen is uh, reassessment notes. Reassessment notes are extremely important. And uh, it doesn't have to be an elaborate note, but it is very important for you to document how the patient is doing after specific some interventions. Uh, even simple words uh, such as unchanged, improve, or worsen is extremely helpful. If you have a patient who has dehydration and they're tachycardic, they're vomiting, and you're giving IV fluid, it is very important afterwards to write uh, patient is doing well, uh, heart rate uh, has come down, and patient is no longer tachycardic. If the patient had uh, uh, asthma exacerbation, if he's getting uh, breathing treatments, it is very important to say patient has improved, uh, feels at baseline, and patient feels comfortable to go home. Uh, there are many examples. Patients come in with chest pain. We give typically uh, uh, medications for their chest pain. It's very important to say the effect of those medications. Simple words, chest pain improved after administration of nitroglycerin. Uh, all of these reassessments uh, are extremely helpful. Throughout an ER stay, we typically see patients multiple times. We've seen probably throughout each hospital's each ER stay. Uh, you see probably the patient two or three times or even sometimes more. It is very important in your documentation to make some notations that patient was seen on multiple occasions during the ER stay and patient has done well, improved, and uh, patient desires to go home if that is the situation. A couple of the things uh, that, you know, when I was sitting there and, and listening to Fred uh, that I learned a lot from him and, and uh, especially with the necrotizing fasciitis, he emphasized a feeling for crepitus and uh, blisters are very much a hallmark of, of a bad outcome. And that uh, look at the sodium, if you're even thinking of necrotizing fasciitis, a low sodium is an early warning uh, signal. Um, and the other thing I learned, you mentioned there's three classic antibiotics that are famous for doing drug interactions. And right. We, we talked about that and one of them was that uh, which uh, drugs uh, or antibiotics have uh, interactions with warfarin. And the three antibiotics that clearly stand out are uh, trimethoprim, trimethoprim sulfamatoxazole, uh, and the next one is metronidazole, and the other ones are uh, fluoroquinolones as a general class. Uh, one specifically that you should remember is trimethoprim sulfamatoxazole, where it actually, in population-based studies, uh, there's actually a real clinical uh, GI side effect reported from that uh, uh, medication. Uh, in asplenic patients, uh, patients are at higher risk of having infections and they are at risk of having uh, infections from very uh, um, 
uh, different organisms, especially encapsulated organisms like Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenzae, and Neisseria meningitidis. Uh, it is very difficult to uh, determine which patients will have septic shock or not. Uh, so there is somewhat actually lower threshold in giving antibiotics to these patients. But if you're not giving antibiotics, it is very important for you to document the thought process and the follow-up uh, outcome. Uh, Greg, I also learned tremendous amount from you from the legal aspects, and one of the things that I learned is how to deal with consultants and what to do with consultants. Uh, as far as when they give you advice. I've noticed at times, and I think many emergency physicians have, where consultant may not be giving the, uh, uh, the appropriate advice. And uh, overall, how do you deal with that? What are we supposed to do, or how do we uh, document that? Well, th this comes up in ID and other areas as well. Uh, you will call a consultant, and it's really important for you to realize that when a case goes to court, they will not hang the consultant they will usually come after you. The consultant is there to give advice, and your role is the doctor for the patient to take the advice or not take the advice. You cannot usually come in and say, well, he told me to do this. You have to uh, answer for yourself. Yeah, one of the things that uh, uh, we also discussed during the lecture was that we make sure that the consultant understands that this is a formal consultation. Uh, I would say document that you obtain a formal consultation, that the consultant understood why you're calling and uh, how this management or at least the intervention is uh, important for you and the advice is important for you. One real important thing that I thought was brought out in the lecture was we had a case of a patient that was treated as a community acquired a no pneumonia uh, when actually they had been in the hospital recently and their organism was hospital acquired and there was a huge payout. So uh, Fred emphasized that when you're in these situations that have algorithms and accepted ways to do things, a neutropenic fever, an asplenic fever, a community acquired pneumonia, a hospital acquired infection, to make sure that you're aware of those algorithms and go down those tracks so you don't get into trouble. Right, especially if those algorithms are clearly in a pre-printed format in your hospital uh, uh, where those are expected for you just to basically go through those algorithms and give the certain antibiotics that your hospital has determined appropriate for that certain condition. When you uh, stray away from those recommendations, especially when it's set within a very specific protocol in your hospital, uh, if you're doing that, make sure you clearly explain uh, what your rationale is and uh, what your thinking process is. And if you have any concerns with that, certainly address it at a, uh, from a different avenue. The medical legal aspect of our work, it is part of our work. And uh, we need to learn how to deal with it, and we need to learn how to minimize it. There is absolutely no way you can get around it. And it is just part of our job. But certainly there are many ways where you can reduce the risk. Yeah, and, then, and, then, and I think awareness is the big thing. You go to lectures, you read, you stay aware, and if you're aware and self-educated and uh, a good communicator with patients, um, then you can't do anything else. You could just hope for the best and realize that you're doing way more good. Um, sure, you might make a mistake once in a while, but the overwhelming good you do should make you feel comfortable, not scared.